Manager Meetings is brought to you by Canalyst, the leading destination for public company data and analysis. Tons of funds we know use Canalyst to get exactly what you'd want for analytical work on companies. They have detailed company-specific models on over 4,000 global equities with clean data, timely adjustments, and relevant KPIs. And each one is available at the click of a button. I've personally found Canalyst models especially helpful as a primer for important positions in advance of manager meetings. So no surprise that their client roster includes a host of allocators too. If you haven't checked out Canalyst recently, I strongly suggest you do. They've been busy extending coverage, building sector-specific dashboards, and just launched a data science library for systematic investors. Give Canalyst a try at canalyst.com slash TED. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Manager Meetings. This show is an exploration of investment opportunities. Through conversations with money managers conducted by one of the manager's institutional clients, we'll share the stories and strategies that attracted their attention and capital. You can learn more and join our mailing list at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted, guest hosts, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Capital Allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Allocators, the firms of guest hosts, or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On today's manager meeting, I interview Andrew Milgram. Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer of Marblegate Asset Management. Marblegate is a $2.6 billion alternative investment manager founded in 2008 that focuses on middle market distressed credit opportunities and special situations. The firm takes a direct sourcing approach and works closely with portfolio companies to create value and drive positive business transformations for sustainable results. Our conversation covers Andrew's very early beginnings in investing, his experience on the sell side, transition to the buy side, and launching of Marblegate. We discuss the nuances of investing in the middle market, valuation, sourcing, due diligence, liquidity, and portfolio construction. We then dive into two headline examples of Marblegate's successes, Education Management Corporation and New York Taxi Medallions. We close with Andrew's views on the state of distressed investing today and his involvement with the Boy Scouts of America. Please enjoy this manager meeting with Andrew Milgram from Marblegate Asset Management. Andrew, great to see you. Good to see you. This is a long time coming. I'm really excited to do this. Why don't we just start with your path in the investment business and into distressed investing? Well, believe it or not, my path starts quite young. So I was born in Beaumont, Texas, and anybody who's ever spent much time with me knows I hold a really deep passion for my hometown of Beaumont. Growing up, my dad spent a lot of time talking to me about investments. Every day after school, we'd go on a long walk, and he would talk to me about his business and talk to me about the stock market, and we would talk about investment ideas, and really quite early he started getting me involved in the stock market. So we would write away to a company for their annual report and we would read it together and analyze it as much as a kid can do. He would then organize taking me out to see a company. So we always look at a company near our hometown. For instance, Goodyear had a plant outside my hometown and we'd go look at the Goodyear plant and poke around and understand the process. Then we would go to the stockbroker's office. Uh, He'd make me dress up and they'd organize some papers for me to sign. It was all obviously pretend. Uh, And then I remember vividly when we do that, the stockbroker would reach under his desk and my dad will have always planted like a little toy with the logo of the company or something connected to the company to give me. And so uh, that was my first introduction to the stock market, to investing. And it really stuck with me and it left a lasting impression on how I think about the world and how I think about investing. How old were you at the time? Well, my father passed away when I was quite young, right around when I was 11 years old. And so really my life up until then, I was very, very close to him. We spent a lot of time together. 
he had his first heart attack when I was very, very young. So he really dedicated a lot of time to making sure he was with my sister and I. So take me through from there to your professional career. So I ended up finishing high school in boarding school here in Connecticut, stayed in the Northeast for college, and then went immediately thereafter to Swiss Bank Corporation. And Swiss Bank was going through a series of changes in those days. It had taken over the O'Connor partnership, and really the O'Connor folks were running Swiss Bank in large part. That was where I really got my first education in what real investing was, because while we were a bank and while we had customer business, the O'Connor culture of proprietary trading really dominated the organization. And so I started out in the U.S. Treasury Group, but then very quickly, this was the mid-90s, I speak Russian and had lived in Russia during college, and so they moved me into the Emerging Markets Group and very quickly on to London, where I joined the Emerging Markets team in London, focused on Eastern Europe, Russia and the Middle East. Um, and it was largely proprietary inv investing at that time. So, oh boy, we can go in a lot of different directions with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you started early, early with your dad, like kind of looking at companies in the stock market. Somewhere along the way, you got into the distressed world. So, what's the path? You're dabbling in emerging markets, mid 90s. Now you're talking 98. 1998, I became a workout guy. I was in London. And we weren't doing a lot of sleeping during the summer of 1998. Of course, the Asian debt crisis had preceded the year before. Long-term capital had been sort of between the Asian debt crisis and the Russia default. Simultaneously, Swiss Bank Corporation and UBS had gone through a merger. UBS was effectively insolvent, and there had been a shotgun marriage forced by the Swiss National Bank. And so we went through that merger. There was a lot of change happening at Swiss Bank in those days, and that was heavily impacted then by the sort of rolling series of crises. And that put me in a position where we were buying instruments at pennies on the dollar and looking for value and thinking about how to extract value from the sovereign or from companies protected by the sovereign where we didn't have the rule of law. And so that was my first introduction to, okay, we've got a big problem here. How do we solve it? From there, I went, uh, came back to the United States and worked for Deutsche Bank. And at Deutsche Bank, I was working in a group that was focused on finding capital market solutions for borrowers. And so you know, that really taught me a, a lot about how companies think about financing themselves and how they access various forms of capital, everywhere from debt to equity and everything in between and how to structure those types of instruments and how they rest on balance sheets and impact the operational thinking of a company. I did that at Deutsche Bank and then on to Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi, where honestly I was not an employee very long uh, because I ran into a guy that had been a, another Swiss bank alum named James Duplessis. And we got to talking. James and his partner, Herb, had run what was called the Swiss Bank Reconstruction Recovery Fund for the better part of the 90s. And in fact, they had really started by buying assets out of the Resolution Trust Corporation. They left the bank during the long-term crisis, and there wasn't a lot for them to do at that period anyway. By this time, it was around 2002, uh, WorldCom was happening. And what I would say is the sort of second advent of the modern distress market emerged. And so they put a fund together called Epic Asset Management. I joined essentially at the beginning of Epic Asset Management. So as you took these various experiences, emerging market workouts, and now you're doing U.S. corporate right side of the balance sheet work, what was different when you took that first step onto the buy side? Well, you know, when I was at Swiss Bank, I was a newbie right out of college. And when I wasn't sort of getting the coffee for somebody, they would let me do something that looked like responsible behavior. When I got to Epic, it was Herb, James, myself, our CFO, Judith Ottensasser, and we were investing principal capital in the market. And in those days, we didn't have as big of a loan market. It was still very heavily a bond market, which meant disclosures were okay, not great. You had to do a lot of primary research. I spent a lot of time on the road seeing companies out in the wild, talking to CEOs, CFOs, doing primary research. And that really impacted how I thought about getting out there and harken back to, honestly to what I did with my dad. Get out, understand the company, really touch it, feel it, talk to the leadership, talk to the employees, talk to the stakeholders around the company, the suppliers, the customers, to really get a sense. The other thing that was very different at Epic as opposed to the places I worked before is we were 
involved in the reorganization process. And one of the interesting things about distress is we exist at the intersection of law and commerce. And so where James in particular was super impactful in how I thought was understanding that intersection and how those two pieces work together, how utilizing the tools of restructuring could impact the reorganization and ultimately the operations of a company. So take me through from there, you know, a couple of years later, you decide to go out on your own. Several years later, sort of the beginning of 2008, my good friend and now business partner, Paul Airway, called me up and he said, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but Bear Stearns, where he worked, is not going to be around much longer. And all great distressed investment firms are born out of crises and this is ours. So we uh, went for a drink at a Midtown restaurant called Biche that doesn't exist anymore, but I'm sure everybody remembers and uh, convinced ourselves what a great idea it would be. And then looked at each other and said, uh, well, do you have access to a lot of capital? (laughs) We then quickly learned that Henry Miller, who was the founder of a firm called Miller Buckfire, specialized in advising primarily companies going through reorganizations, also had an interest in starting an investment firm focused on distressed and went to talk to Henry and talk to him about how we saw the opportunity set in the distressed market, uh, which he agreed with. And he introduced us to some investors he had who agreed to stake us in starting Marblegate. What is that investment philosophy you decided to pursue? So a lot of the investment firms that focus on distress had gotten bigger and bigger. And their growth had really mirrored the growth in the LBO market. So if you think about the leverage buyout market as the manufacturing division of the distressed market, the growth of the distressed investor mirrored the growth of the LBO investor for good reason. But the consequence of that is that as those firms got larger on each side, you left a huge swath of middle market companies that were relatively underinvested by the distressed community. Meanwhile, the middle market constitutes roughly a third of U.S. GDP. It has 48 million employees. And at the same time, the middle market constitutes about three quarters of all bankruptcies and restructurings. From our perspective, that gap between the amount of capital that was in the middle market, the amount of restructuring activity that was in the middle market, and where the large distressed investors were focused didn't make a ton of sense. So you look at that and you see what feels like a supply-demand mismatch. People talk about the middle market or anything smaller as, oh, it's less efficient. There's a, And in distress, it's just such a different game because your actions impact outcomes. So I'd love to hear more about what you see as the aspects of mid-market distressed that create these opportunities when you're actually in it. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating space because these companies are relatively under- followed. They're less understood. They have smaller creditor groups. So a typical creditor group in a middle market company would be 12, 15, maybe 18 creditors as opposed to 50 or 100 in a large name. They have less flexible capital structures. So by that, I mean they tend to continue to be focused on borrowing money from the U.S. banking system, as opposed to the CLO market or some of the direct lending market, you know, the banking market still provides the overwhelming amount of capital provided to companies in this country. And those banks are required to have covenants and they have well-structured loans in order for them to be what are called pass credits, as examined by the Federal Reserve and the OCC. So those inflexible capital structures provide us the opportunity to use the rights and remedies afforded under the credit agreements to drive the outcome. Now, also in the middle market, you have some unique qualities, let's say. So you have uneven management teams, right? They, you know, not everybody went through the GE management training program. Not everybody has a Harvard MBA. These are oftentimes super entrepreneurial, but sometimes underprepared management teams for the challenges they face. Simultaneously, you know, not every company that finds itself in distress is backed by a sponsor who has a deep well of experience in dealing with problems. And so when those problems arise, the sponsor sometimes either retreats or is just incapable of addressing those problems. How do you think about the quality of the businesses, the underlying business? Obviously, things in distress have a problem, but sometimes businesses are smaller for a reason. 
you know, one of the things we say around here is we dig a lot of dry holes. So we look at lots and lots and lots of companies and disqualify them for any number of reasons. The biggest reason we'll disqualify them is exactly what you said. They have a problem for a reason. And that problem is hard to solve, maybe impossible to solve. They might be in an industry which is in secular decline. They might be in a regulatory position that doesn't have a good outcome to it. And so we'll disqualify them. A lot of our time is spent looking at companies and assessing whether or not there even is a solve to what they're facing. Are you able to look at things, I want to say at an evaluation discount? Obviously, there's size, there's distress. So I'm not sure what that means relative to something else. But how do you think about the relative valuation opportunity? It's a great question, and it's one we oftentimes think about. And the distress market can get ahead of itself. So I can tell lots of stories about where you would see something trading in the distress market at a premium from a valuation perspective to where its public market comps are trading, which I view as literally insane. But it happens, and it happens, believe it or not, more often than you think. So we are focused on buying at the right price and at the right valuation. One of the things that, that we talk a lot about at Marblegate is the source of all outcomes is the buy price. So if you don't get the buy price right, you reduce your degree of flexibility, you reduce the opportunity to create outcomes that are good for your investors. So I want you to walk me through this process. Where do these ideas come from? The real answer is they come from all over the place. But practically speaking, we have a dedicated sourcing team. So we have four people who are full-time calling on banks, finance companies, commercial lenders of all stripe, talking to those creators of credit and trying to understand what in their portfolio is troubling them, what are they dealing with from a regulatory perspective that they might need to change their exposures. Because look, at the end of the day, I say this all the time, banks in particular make decisions about their portfolio for three reasons, regulatory, regulatory, and regulatory. Because uh, banks are, are regulated industries. As a regulated industry, they are very focused on how they deal with their regulator and the bank examinations that they're put through. And if something's a fail credit, or broadly speaking, something that doesn't meet the standards set by the regulators, there's a capital charge. That capital charge impacts their earnings power. And so for them, it becomes a math problem. And we want to be in a constant dialogue with those creators of credit so that we understand what challenges they're facing and where they may want to shape their portfolio. How do you think about the importance of call it idiosyncratic or proprietary, you know, it's a big buzzword, sourcing compared to the huge number of companies in the mid-market that will just spit out some distress situations? If only that were true. I wish that there was just a machine down at the corner, we drop a quarter in and out would come a list of available companies. It just doesn't work that way. Broadly speaking, those creators of credit are not happy to advertise the mistakes they've made. And they're not super happy to realize the losses associated with it. And so part of our job is to work with them to help them understand our perspective on a credit and why we may be better positioned to push forward. The distressed workout a reorganization process is a very hands-on process. And there is a ton of idiosyncratic risk embedded in every company. The first line of Anna Karenina says, all happy families are the same. Unhappy families are unhappy for their own reasons. I didn't get that line exactly right, <laughs> but you get the point. Unhappiness is generally an idiosyncratic experience. And so Oftentimes, original lenders don't have the manpower or the time or sometimes even the economic interest to go super deep in understanding how they're going to work through those idiosyncratic problems. And we're better positioned to do that. So once you've found a potential opportunity, take me through that analytical process you go through before you even decide, is this something you want to get involved in? We start by bringing it to our morning meeting and talking about the company generally, just general impressions of the company, the industry, things we may or may not already know about a company or an industry or a problem facing a company or an industry. Again, most companies that we hear about get brought to us, we disqualify. But if we're not disqualifying it at that initial stage, uh, the analyst will start to take a look at it. Now, we think about our analytical process not as a bowling alley, but as a team sport. 
And so we'll generally put a handful of people on a particular company that we're looking at, looking at different aspects of it. So our portfolio operations team will start even at the initial stages of diligence, looking at what are the problems in, in their operations and what are the value levers that you could pull potentially and think about what's constraining the company from pulling those today. Our uh, investment analysts are looking at the financial performance of the company, really unpacking in particular its working capital and balance sheet issues because problems that a company can persist for a very long time they punctuate because of a liquidity problem. And at the end of the day, working capital management is a really misunderstood and undervalued portion of highly levered company management, and it can get away from a company pretty fast. Uh, so we spent a lot of time understanding that capital allocation process inside of a company and how it's realized in their financial results. But we team tackle the company thinking about how we would analyze it and how we would think about it and start to think about what is the price point in which we would be willing to enter the company. Now, where we're willing to enter and where a creator of that credit is willing to sell it sometimes can be really far apart, but it's our job to come up with a price uh, where we are willing to enter. And you know, sometimes we'll talk to a bank for literally months, sometimes years about a credit before they come to realize our price. What is the trading dynamics of this? Because you're talking about wide bid ask spreads, talking directly to banks in a world where trading in so many financial instruments are on exchange, technology driven, maybe even crypto driven in the future. What does it look like in your world? It's very, very negotiated head to head. We spend a lot of time talking to banks. Nothing produces an offer like a steak dinner. So we spend a lot of time out in little cities around the country talking to those lenders, trying to understand what their constraints are and trying to help them understand our perspective on a credit. And they have their own committees to work through their own creditor processes that they work through in order to figure out what they're going to decide. We are, generally speaking, in negotiated outcomes, so there aren't competitive bids. About three quarters of what we have bought has been direct sourced, non-competitive. And once you start building this, I'm curious kind of what a portfolio looks like. Super idiosyncratic. You know, it's a, uh, it's a funny world. So we don't get the advantage of opening up the paper and saying to ourselves, you know, I, I think this Google thing has got legs. We have to look at what a lender is willing to sell. You know, that can be for a long time, for the last couple of years, lenders wanted to sell all their oil and gas exposure. Meanwhile, uh, having grown up in Texas with a family that's deeply rooted in the oil and gas industry, uh, I, I often joke, I have oil and gas in my veins like literally in my veins. But we stayed away from oil and gas, primarily because as we thought about it, there was you were primarily taking commodity price risk. And that's a hard thing for us, or, well, impossible thing for us to control. And so the tools of restructuring, our value-biased approach to things, couldn't see a way to invest responsibly or consistent with what we've let our, our investors know we would do. We're going to take a quick break in the action to talk to you about Coinbase Institutional, the first choice for institutions investing in digital assets. Over 11,000 institutional clients use Coinbase's secure, comprehensive, and scalable products to manage their digital assets, including Coinbase Prime and Exchange. Coinbase also recently announced that they're on a path to launching derivatives. As the only publicly traded company with experience trading and custodying crypto assets at scale, Coinbase Institutional executes some of the largest trades in the industry for futuristic companies. Invest with the most trusted name in crypto and learn more by visiting coinbase.com slash institutional. So once you have this portfolio, I know there is a really hands-on process of what happens once you own something totally different from stocks or whatever. Would love you to take me through how you think about it as if it's a playbook, if each one's idiosyncratic, but what is it that you're trying to do in these situations to extract value? First and foremost, part of our investment process is that while we invest in companies, we buy documents. And those documents are what enable us to drive the investment process. And so it's a, it is a very, very active hands-on approach both to the financial restructuring, where we're reorienting the capital structure of the company, reforming it to something that we think is durable and sustainable, but then 
post reorganization, we have folks here who are working with the management teams to mitigate operational risk, to enhance value creation, and then actively govern our exit process, our value realization. And do you try to figure that out before you buy, like the receptivity of the management team to feedback, to making changes before you go and start purchasing securities? Well, you know, one of the five C's of credit investing is character. And so we are very focused on character of the management team as we think about investing. Look, some of the reality of the restructuring process is that not every management team wants to go through a restructuring process. By the time we've shown up, we're there because the things that that management team has tried have not worked. And some of them are just frustrated to the point that they want to exit the business. And it's hard running a company going through distress. Uh, Responsible CEOs spend a lot of time caring for those people that work for them. And it's a stressful environment. And the punctuation of the restructuring process is sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes an opportunity for a management team to go do something else. And there is an opportunity for a new either entire management team or partial reconstruction of the management team to come in and think about how to create value going forward. I'd love to walk through to bring this to life. There are at least two examples, but two that I know of where you have been part of the investment in the news. <laughs> and those are you know, one way back in education management, which came up in the Caesars restructuring book because of what you did. And then more recently in the fun one to talk about taxi medallions in New York, And why don't you just pick one of them to start and would just love to hear kind of soup to nuts what that story was. You know, our investment in the New York City taxi industry is a super interesting one. And it was it's been a multi-year process. Our involvement in Education Management Corporation is slightly different in that we were prosecuting a right that we believed exist under the credit agreements. And we did that using the Trust and Denture Act of 1937, and specifically Section 316B of the Trust and Denture Act, which basically said every bondholder has an inalienable right to its principal and interest. And we narrowly construed the meaning of those words to say we had the right to actual practical enforcement and collection of principal and interest. And uh, we brought EDMC to court, to district court in New York, where the district court ruled in our favor. Now, in fairness, it was appealed and went to the Second Circuit Court, where the Second Circuit broadly read Section 316B and said we didn't have a practical right to principal and interest, but rather we had this illusory right to sue even if there was an empty box that you were suing. So I don't exactly agree with the outcome of that case, as you can tell. And frankly, there are other versions of that litigation that are currently sort of winding their way around the market and through the courts. And so I don't think the last word has been spoken on Section 316B of the Trust and Denture Act. There are a few things you threw in there, like an empty box, a right to principal and interest versus the right to go after your principal and interest. And maybe using that or as another example, put a little more color on just as an example of what happens in one of these processes. So you're opening up a pretty big box of opportunity <laughs> to talk because we're in we're in a really interesting period in the market. That interesting period arises from the loosening of credit agreements that we've heard a lot about in the news over a lot of years. And so as credit agreements have been watered down over time, you have as a result, what I call a lot of white space in these credit agreements. There's just a lot of room for interpretation, a lot of room for moving around pieces of the credit agreement, pieces of the underlying collateral to the advantage of some creditors and disadvantage of other creditors. And this creditor-on-creditor violence is a rising trend that I don't see going away anytime soon until the creditor groups start to write tighter credit agreements or the courts define very narrow guidelines around how these credit agreements can be interpreted. Uh, We're going to see more and more moving around of the boxes taking collateral from one group of holders and pledging it to another group of holders, interpretation of words that are advantaging some stakeholders over others. And I don't see that going away anytime soon. And and like I said, I think I see a rise of that over coming years. 
So before we get to the taxi example, I'm really curious about the recursive nature of how this plays out in competitors in the space. So when you're talking about moving collateral or assets from one box to another, on the other side of that are a group of hedge funds, a group of bondholders, a group of real money owners, or whatever it is, that some are winning and some are losing. And that's in one example. Now there's going to be another example in another. So how do you think about participating and investing in this space when so much of it can feel like zero sum? Look, it's a really interesting question. And, and, and it's playing, played out in a kind of interesting way in the CERTA case, CERTA Simmons, the betting company. So in that case, a group of secondary market purchasers, hedge funds, bought up a big chunk of the debt, went to the company and said, we'd like to do what's called an up-tier exchange. So we'd like to break the credit agreement into two parts and essentially stack one half of it on top of the other half, sort of creating a waterfall of collateral disposition, which advantaged, obviously, the folks at the top of the capital structure. And a very clever investment banker, who's a friend of mine, unfortunately, oftentimes works across the table from me on restructurings, went to the group that would likely be disadvantaged and said, well, if this were about to happen to you, would you take the offensive position, which he convinced them to do? So you ended up with the group that would typically be the villains of the story as the victims and those who were typically the victims as the quote unquote villains in the story. And it makes for a very interesting lawsuit, uh, which I encourage anybody who's looking for a sleep aid to read (laughs) because the expected archetypal roles are reversed here. Look, I think that there's a belief system out there that some of the traditional participants in the credit market are somehow less aggressive or less capable. And that's clearly not the case. There are a huge number of very, very thoughtful, very value-focused participants in the credit markets. And I think this sort of notion that there are aggressors and victims may have once existed, but now the market learns, market participants learn from realized experience. And I think there's a much more level playing field today. And I think that, look, we all have a fiduciary duty to the investors we serve. And so if the opportunity for value creation exists, it's your obligation to take it. You mentioned at the onset as private equity market soared in size, so did the distressed market and the players. And I'm curious how the size of funds impacts what happens in the restructurings on a deal-by-deal basis. So it depends on the investor. There are times when we end up in deals with much larger investors and who may well have a much larger position in the credit than we do. One of the advantages of having done this as long as my partner Paul and I have is that we've got a huge number of friends and folks we know at other firms uh, for a very long period of time and a strong working relationship you know, through those relationships. And so we've been able to, over time, work super cooperatively with them. Now, that being said, there are situations, and we try to suss this out ahead of time, where what's going on in one case may impact the decisions in another case with the same group of characters just in different seats in different cases. And you have to be aware of the sort of three dimensions of the chessboard as you think about where you will and won't participate. Honestly, it's why we like to be in the middle market because there's way, way, way less of that in the middle market. We are oftentimes the only secondary buyer in a credit we're working on. We're certainly the early identifier and early adopter of that credit. And so that reduces a lot of the sort of intramurals that you sometimes see amongst the stressed funds. All right. Well, let's turn to this taxi example, which I think is a good example of that, where you were the player in this particular game. My partner, Paul, who does a lot of sourcing for us, came back from talking to a New York bank and he said, hey, you know, I just got back from talking to this bank and they've got a portfolio of loans against New York City taxi medallions. They want to know if we want to take a look. And I looked at him and said, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I say, you know, how they're, they're aware of Uber, I presume. So we put it down and three, four weeks later, he came back to my office and said, you know, I just got, a, got off the phone with that bank uh, that we talked about, the taxi medallions. And they want to know if, uh, if we ever took a look. And, you know, what do you think? I said, remains the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> I have zero interest in it. And so then Paul said to me, what are, I think, 
widely understood to be distressed fighting words. He said, so you're telling me there's no price you would pay? I said, okay, well, you know, if you've laid down the gauntlet, then fine, I'll take a look. And so we spent a week looking at what we knew and the information that they could provide us. And after that week, really understood the only thing we knew about taxi medallions in New York City is what we knew from riding in the back seat. And that there was a huge universe and ecosystem that surrounded the medallion system that was at once super scary, highly regulated, but offered a huge opportunity from our perspective if you could understand that there was a durable nature to the cash flow. And that started what amounted to a two-year research process for us to convince ourselves that there was a durable income stream associated with the medallions. Uh, our first purchase was of outright medallions and literally found out about it by doing what any good distress guy does. I opened the Wall Street Journal and I immediately turned to the distress guy sporting pages, which are the uh, foreclosure notices in the back. And there was a foreclosure notice for 46 medallions being auctioned on behalf of Citibank. And it was an auctioneer we knew and called him up and said, hey, Citibank want to a uh, stalking horse bid. And we negotiated back and forth quickly with Citibank and ended up buying 46 medallions in an open outcry auction at the airport Marriott at LaGuardia. <laughs> For certain, I was the only investment manager there. And I will tell you that there were a lot of cab drivers who were looking to get a good deal on the medallions there to bid. And uh, we got, uh, we were able to buy all of them. What did you find in that research process that confirmed in your eyes that there was some base business where clearly there was this threat of Uber? Really, there were three things. So number one, yellow taxis are a piece of New York City's infrastructure. And the city thinks about it that way. And so in New York City, where we've got a subway system that wasn't really well thought out and last mile transportation is a real important component of the public infrastructure system, taxis play an immediate and important role, particularly in Manhattan, which is the bulk of their business. The second thing is the impact of the yellows on the city's budget. So they are a meaningful line item on the city's budget every year and a line item that we felt confident New York City recognized and would ultimately want to protect. The third piece of that is that as one old hand in the taxi industry said to me when I was visiting with him in his garage, they just haven't reinvented the economics of driving a car. And so when we thought about that, and we ran a bunch of surveys of Uber drivers to understand really what their net earnings were. And what we could see is notwithstanding the advertising and the glitz and all the great work that Uber was doing, sort of attracting drivers and riders into its system, the profitability of a yellow taxi driver was superior to that of an Uber driver. Now, Uber offers other values, but in terms of driving a taxi, it's a better job if you're treating it as a job uh, in terms of earning power. It's a hard job. So one, one of the pieces of our diligence process is I became a licensed taxi driver and went out and drove cabs, which I still do. I get out and make sure that I drive, understand what's happening amongst the drivers, sort of see conditions on the road and how the public is interacting. How did it progress from that first set of medallions to a full portfolio? We did a couple of things. Once the market was reset and in some large measure by that auction we took part in, uh, we began talking to particularly the federally chartered banks, which there were a handful that had exposure into this market. By that point, these were going to be qualified assets, we were very certain, and the banks were going to look to dispose of them for all of the regulatory capital reasons we talked about earlier. We identified one or two that had large portfolios and began discussions with them. The first large portfolio we bought was uh, a 1,000 medallions or so, and that formed the real core of the portfolio we ultimately built. We followed with several smaller portfolio purchases. And then uh, the sort of big signature portfolio that we bought was NCUA, which is the governing body which oversees the credit unions. And a number of credit unions had failed as a consequence of their exposure to the taxi medallion industry. And so the NCUA had seized those assets on behalf of their stakeholders and were auctioning them off. And that was a long process. It was difficult only because the NCUA was 
super sensitive to the treatment of the underlying borrower, which we were as well. Look, the reality is that these drivers who are out driving taxi cabs are super hardworking people and largely immigrants. I feel as though I have a particular connection. My father's an immigrant to this country. I take the immigrant experience super seriously, and it's meaningful to me that this was a on-ramp into American commerce for people who come to this country for a better opportunity. So they wanted to make sure that those values were expressed in how we were prosecuting our investment. So if, if we had a churn, burn, go seize people's assets, kick them out of their homes, I don't believe the NCOA would have worked with us. Instead, what we could demonstrate to them was that we were working with borrowers to try to reorient their capital structure to something that was sustainable and durable and match the earnings power of the underlying asset. So the last time, you know, I remember, this is, goes back a number of years ago, but there was a point in time when these medallions, maybe it was pre-Uber, just went through the roof and people were levering up to buy them. And I'm kind of curious, in that process of a restructuring, you can imagine in a company, a management team gets changed, people go on to different jobs, but each of these medallions is someone's entire livelihood. And so what happened on the interpersonal side or the emotional side of that, where people had this mountain of debt and you're presumably buying them at much, much lower prices than where maybe they had purchased it in the first place? So we've got a team of folks who are out working with individual borrowers. And I would also say that New York City did a a really great thing, and they set up New York City Taxi Driver Resource Center, which they provide legal staff to help borrowers understand their obligations, their rights, uh, their choices uh, facing them under a restructuring. And so we've really focused on dealing with borrowers in a way to recognize that this is not an easy thing for them and that invariably a reorganization carries with it, you know, some feeling that they've somehow failed, uh, which I don't believe in any way, shape or form. The data, which we're super heavy data users, and the data shows that overwhelmingly a New York City taxi driver is a super hardworking individual that's out generally supporting their family and oftentimes an extended family overseas based on their earnings. And so it's important to us that we're working individually with each of these borrowers, working with our partners in New York City to get to a good solution for them. At the end of the day, I would also say the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which is a organization which represents taxi drivers, has been a very good partner as well that we've really liked working with. They are an advocacy group and they have strong views about where they'd like to see the industry, but I've uh, very much found them to be a constructive partner that is helpful to deal with. How do you think about for lack of a better way of saying it, performance on this investment through a couple lenses. One is like you've got a required rate of return for your fund, but it's also the kind of thing that if you did really, really well and people knew that, somewhere along the way, there's so much potential kind of front page risk in an investment like this. I'm kind of curious when you're going into it, how do you think about how that all plays out? Look, I think you're sort of framing the question in terms of what people are broadly calling ESG or how do we think about our role and our investors return in the context of, you know, what is a real impact on a real human being. And so we have an ESG policy and things like that, but we lean pretty heavily into the concept of being responsible participants in the market. I oftentimes say we find companies or borrowers at moments of great change, and we have an opportunity to impact the direction and outcome of that company or that borrower's next 5, 10, 15 years. The easiest decision we make is the buy decision. We're going to make a thousand other decisions that require us to think about the impact of that decision on the borrower, on their earnings power, what it means for them longer term. And so our investors expect us both to generate them a return, but to act responsibly in the context of the borrower, if that's an individual in the case of a taxi medallion, or if it's a middle market manufacturer in somewhere in Appalachia. Our investors expect the same from us under all conditions. I want to take a step back and get your perspectives today on the distressed market. Well, you know, it's interesting, right? So the Torah of Value investing is uh, Graham and Dodd security analysis. The Talmud is uh, investment analysis by Ben Graham. So in the latter, you know, there's an entire chapter on investing through inflation. That's, I think, the second chapter of the book. 
I am in the camp that believes we are in a period of sustained inflation, and that is going to have a deleterious effect on the earnings power of companies. That's sort of unavoidable. Now, inflation, you know, there's, in fact, I think Ben Graham talks about a little bit of inflation can be good for investing. The problem is that a lot of inflation tends to be very bad. It can be good if you're in a an asset that has a, a heavy degree of fixed assets, and then the earnings on that fixed asset are going up on a nominal basis, that generates a higher rate of return. But generally speaking, in the leveraged market today, we have asset light companies because of the financial engineering that sponsors have engaged in, which means we're more heavily exposed to factor inputs such as labor and raw materials, all of which are going straight up. And so in the highly levered environment that we're in today, where we start from a place where companies have 1.1 debt service coverage ratios, it doesn't take a whole lot of movement in the price of labor or in the price of factor inputs to drop that coverage ratio below one, in which case those companies just can't pay their bills. And you know, it strikes me that what we see today as we look at the earnings power of companies that we're talking to lenders about, that they are in that place already. They are facing real inability to satisfy their debts as they come due, which is one of the classic definitions of insolvency. And so from my perspective, I do see a large wholesale opportunity to engage in insolvency reorganizations in the coming period. Now, one of the advantages we have is you think about investing in a period of inflation, you can invest in price makers rather than price takers, or you can use the tools of distress and restructuring to reset price. So in a restructuring, uh, chapter 11 allows you to reject executory contracts and reset price. And if you're in a relationship, let's say, with a customer where the price is just wrong and it's producing a negative margin to you, you're quite happy to get rid of that customer or reset it to a level where it's profitable. But those are the choices. And distressed or restructuring gives you that opportunity. Now, we haven't seen that kind of opportunity since like the early 2000s when natural gas spiked and we had to do a sort of price reset through the petrochemicals chain. But it strikes me that we're going to see that across a number of sectors in the coming period. On top of that, look, I think we sit at an interesting moment in time. I think here we are in the the end of the first quarter 2022. And I think we should understand it as the end of the period of the peace dividend. So, you know, you and I grew up in the Reagan era and the onset of the peace dividend. I think the dividend has now been cut and that has real implications to how we think about the world. Additionally, the supply chain is disrupted. It is likely to continue to be disrupted. Uh, I think that the period of global stability that the post-war period brought to us, I think we should understand is over and that we're now entering a period of more chronic instability. And so if you're a company that sort of relied on Ricardian trade theory to find the lowest cost of production in order to serve the U.S. consumer, you're going to re need to rethink that, which has implications for capital allocation, working capital usage, liquidity. You're going to move from just in time to just in case. All of those things have balance sheet implications, which today's balance sheets are not structured to handle. And so you have two choices, either don't handle them and expose yourself to the risks that are attendant or restructure the balance sheet to deal with the reality of the environment that we're likely to be in for an extended period. Who do you think in that process of change of corporate balance sheets will suffer the most? <laughs> Non-active creditors. You know, look, there's been a huge industry grown up around the restructuring process. We have armies of bankers and lawyers and turnaround professionals, all of whom are, will happily charge a fee to, quote unquote, help you or help the borrower through the reorganization process. From our perspective, there are super talented individuals and companies and professional services firms that are doing that. Uh, there are a huge number that are not. And as a consequence, you could see the reorganization process if you are not an actively engaged creditor destroy as much value as the underlying fundamentals are destroying. And so you cannot be a passive participant in a reorganization. It is incumbent upon you as a creditor going through reorganization to be active. It's an understood predicate 
that in a reorganization, junior stakeholders are in a difficult place from value realization or value preservation. Much like the duties of a board shift in a reorganization from the equity holder to the debt holder, so too the duties of a creditor shift from passive participant and collector of coupon to active participant and defender and creator of value. I want to get a chance to turn to a couple of closing questions, but before I do, despite how calm this conversation has been, we all know the distressed market is a bit of a rough and tumble market and things can get heated. And you're one of the few people I've met in the business that alongside being a day-to-day distressed investor is deeply involved in the Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd love to hear a little bit both about that and about how you sort of bring those two together. Look, everything I learned about leadership, I learned in the Boy Scouts. And it also gave me, like we talked about earlier, you know, my father passed away at an early age and he had me involved in the Boy Scouts as a sort of fundamentally American thing to do. And he was quite proud to have his son doing. I think my mom on the back of that also saw it as a really good way to make sure that I had structure and that I was finding ways to get that void at least partially filled. And, you know, I took a lot away from the Boy Scouts and my participation in the Boy Scouts. It was really important to me and I think important to a lot of people. I think it's a fabulous organization. And look, there's a lot of, like a lot of organizations that have existed for a long period of time, it's had a lot of trouble and it's gotten itself into a lot of trouble. It's going through its own reorganization at the moment for good reason, by the way. It made mistakes, big mistakes uh, along the way. But for me, it was a super important organization. I will tell you, it sounds corny. I recite the Scout Oath and Law to myself every single day. It really provides the backbone of how I think about the world. And so one of the big pieces of scouting is to give back. And it's funny, when we moved, my wife and I moved uh, shortly after our oldest child was born from Manhattan out to Connecticut, the local Boy Scout Council puts up signs every year that says, if you were a scout, it's time to give back. And where I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, we were all Boy Scouts. And so my wife was subjected to years and years of sitting <laughs> around listening to my buddies and I talk about our scouting adventures and this and that that we did in Boy Scouts. And so we got to town and we were driving down the street and saw one of these signs. And my wife says, OK, big talker, put your money where your mouth is. And so I went, uh, came in and, and asked them to give me a pencil pushing job to support the organization. I told them, I, I've got a child who'll be scouting age soon enough, but in the meantime, just give me some support work to do, which they happily did. I ended up becoming pretty involved in the Greenwich Council of the Boy Scouts, and I got to do it during a period of uh, real change in the organization. So uh, like a lot of organizations, particularly those that have a heavy reliance on religious organizations, uh, they had a difficult time reconciling uh, their desire to serve youth and be a leadership organization with how they thought about people who had lifestyles that were unfamiliar, particularly to their religious groups that, that were affiliated. And so I had an opportunity to be involved in a period of change where we moved an organization which was resistant to gay youth and gay adults being part of the organization to making sure that, you know, the benefits of scouting were open to everyone. And, you know, that was a really, I was pretty proud of my participation in that because I do believe strongly in the benefits of scouting and I do believe strongly in the scout oath and law. And I think that it doesn't, uh, scout oath and law is sort of uh, there irrespective of sexual orientation, race, color, creed, and it should be available to everyone. Great. All right, Andrew, I'm going to close with a couple of questions that you know well are coming. So <laughs> what's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I spend a lot of time on both of those things. You know, I like to learn. So I'm always trying to find new things to learn about, whether that's reading or participating in classes or lectures. I like to find out stuff that I don't know. What's your biggest personal pet peeve? I don't have a lot. I'm a little bit of a live and let live guy. So I, I try not to judge other people. I, I don't have a lot that bothers me about other people. How about on the investment side? That I've got a lot of. 
For me, when we're talking about an investment or dealing in a reorganization, poorly informed qualitative generalities don't really do it for me. This is an in the weeds game. You know, so one of the things I talk to my investment team about is you invest with a butcher's knife, but you restructure with a scalpel. And if you don't do the detail work, you're going to get a bad outcome. And so details matter. And oftentimes people forget that and they really want to do a lot of hand waving and generalizations. I don't care for that so much. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Well, I'm going to cheat and give you three. The first is a guy named David Biazzi, who I worked for in London and uh, remains a very, very close friend. He was the best man at my wedding. Uh, his oldest daughter just interned for us recently. He gave me a lot of the practical thinking of investing that I still rely on today. The second is uh, James Duplessis, who I worked for at Epic Asset Management, who really taught me the nuts and bolts of the distressed business in a way that I had only really casually understood before that. And you know, he was a great thought partner and was super happy to engage with me seven days a week about things we were working on or even ideas that I had and was a great teacher. The third, and honestly, most important out of all of that is my partner, Paul Airway. So I told you, Paul's the one who called me up and said, let's do this. You know, if I think back and think around who else I would have as a partner, uh, there's really no one who is better suited to partner with. We complement each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses. He's great at things that I am terrible at, and I like to think that I'm good at things that he's not as good at. And so we're great partners, uh, great friends, and you know, we've been, you know, we're heading into our 15th year as partners, and there aren't a lot of people on Wall Street who survive as partners for 15 years. What's the biggest mistake you made and what did you learn from it? I mean, that's an entirely separate podcast. The mistakes I've made are legend. And look, a lot of what we're doing are making assessments about the path that a company is going to go on and understanding uh, the choices that they have made and the consequences of those. And so honestly, Ted, I can tell you th there isn't one giant mistake I made. I've made a host of mistakes over and over again. What I try to do and what the team here tries to do is learn from those mistakes so that we don't make them again. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I was really lucky, even though, you know, I had a sort of not great part of my childhood. I was very close to my parents and uh, remained super close to my mom. They were both, and my mom remains, very committed to do your best. If I think about the values that she imparted to me and my sister, who is, by the way, the much smarter and more successful of the two of us, those things continue to drive my everyday choices. And so one of the things that I tell my kids that my parents told me all the time, always do your best. All right, Andrew, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? It's all going to be fine. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> all right, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Ted. It's been a long time coming, and I really appreciate you making time for me. That's great fun. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and maybe even piqued your interest to explore further. See you next time.